The Webot's distance sensor node can simulate several types of practical, low-cost range sensors. These are devices that sense the location of a nearby object along a line or in a cone. And uh, there are sonar versions that use sound and optical versions that use light uh, to perform this that are fairly practical kinds of devices. Here's a practical run through of some of the simulation questions. First, let's look at the view menu under optional rendering. There's an option here for show distance sensor rays, and I recommend that you turn that on so that each sensor will then have a bundle of rays uh, rendered, which help you to visualize where it's looking. We're going to look at the sort of left uh, robot here, coming a little closer, and we can see there's a yellow cone at the end, which is drawn to represent the location of the sensor and some rays coming out. So we'll run it briefly here. You'll see those rays turn red. The rays being red indicate that the sensor is active. Sensors need to be enabled to be used. Um, otherwise, they won't, they won't act and, and report values. So if we look at this again, um, we can um, go ahead and expand this to try to find the sensor. Tooling here is imported as a proto file, and so it only has high-level parameters. But if we go and convert that to base nodes, we'll generate a full robot tree that we can look through. The sensor is attached to the end of link two, and so we can tunnel down through the kinematics to walk the kinematic tree and find link two to see where it appears. So here at the on link two, we see a couple of things. First is the, the normal uh, shape of the link two objects, but then also this new distance sensor object, which is there attached to at the end. If we open that and expand it, we see a couple of properties. It has a translation and rotation with respect to the parent frame. The translation vector here positions it at the end of link two. It has um, a uh, can have a bounding object for collision in physics for physic uh, for adding dynamics. In this case, those are null. So the yellow cone object that represents the sensor itself doesn't participate in dynamics. It's just there for rendering, and this is a way of instrumenting the system without changing its properties. One more point to note here is there's a lookup table which just has two entries but could have more. There's three entries per vector. The first is the physical distance of a calibration point, and the second is the reported distance. In this example, 000, zero, zero means that a distance of zero meters will produce a result of zero. The second entry means that a distance of 0.9 meters will report a distance of 0.9. So it's calibrated one to one in meters. This implies the maximum range is 0.9 meters, and that's the length which those rays are being drawn. The third term is not being used, but it could be introduced to use, uh, used to introduce noise into the measurement, which can be very practical for trying to submit a real system. Another thing to note here is there's a number of rays at set to five. If we increase that here, um, you'll see there's this, a bundle of rays outside the end of the sensor. If I go ahead and increase that, there are more, more rays in that bundle. And if I take the aperture width, which is an, an angle in radians, and I start to increase that, we'll see that the, the cone gets larger. So in these ways, one can simulate different properties of sensors that have a different aperture width and uh, use a different number of samples, uh, which are average to form the distance measurement. There's also a type field, which can be used to select between a couple of different types. Uh, we're just using a very generic model here, and the, other, the others have some specific properties. Laser can only have one ray, and it also will draw a laser dot at the end when it, where it collides with an object. So those are a couple of the high-level properties of here. Let's look a little bit at the children of the distance sensor node itself. And that's where we find the actual shape. There's a transform wrapping around a child, which is a shape, which is a cone. And that this is the object that is used for graphics. It's used for rendering the sensor at the end. If I were to uh, now uh, take this distance sensor and simply uh, copy it, I could insert a second sensor and then manipulate that one. I'll insert that. Um, into the same place here and get a second sensor. So now if I, if I look at the translation of this, I can see I can, I can pick the second sensor here and I can position it in a different place and possibly rotate it. And because I've left it in the same point in the kinematic tree, it's going to be a second sensor that um, is attached to the same frame. Um, you'll notice that the if you look at the carefully, uh, here's a subtlety here, if we look at the, um, the distance sensor itself, it's looking along its own x-axis. That's the red axis. And so there, that's, that is why the cone itself needed to be rotated so that uh, it would align with that x-axis of the sensor. Something to keep in mind when you're positioning it is, is exactly where it's going to look. The second thing is that it does need a good name. 
the name of the sensor is used in the code to look up its values. So let's look at that as the last step here. I'm going to come back to the top, look at the robot, and select Edit Controller to open up the control program. And just the one thing to note here is, um, after the robot is open, there's a step where the robot object is queried with get distance sensor using the name of the sensor to get a handle on that sensor. And then an important step is it needs to be enabled with a sampling rate. In this case, it's being sampled as the, at the same rate as the underlying control loop. That, that tells the simulator how often to evaluate the geometry, intersect those rays with the world, and calculate a reported value. And then when we go to use it down below, we simply get value and it returns a single scalar value with those calibrations. If the distance to the world is larger than that sensor maximum reading, it simply always returns the maximum. It always seems to return a number. So detecting whether it's less than some maximum value is the only way that I've seen to detect whether it's actually triggering. For further details, we could look more into the documentation, but that's a practical way to use it. So there you have it. There's a, a, a quick rundown on the nature of the distance sensor object, how to enable rendering in the, in the scene, how to attach it into a scene tree in another object, and a few comments about um, creating geometry to, to visualize it.